Good morning, everyone. If you would, please take your seats. First off, did everyone enjoy the general and breakout sessions yesterday? Can we get a... Very good. And did you enjoy the networking reception yesterday evening after that very long day of classes and learning? Everyone had a good time? Very good. For those just joining us today, again, on behalf of our acting director, Dr. Galvin, and the Office of Small Business Programs at the DOD level, we'd like to welcome you again to the Small Business Training Week here in Atlanta. Uh, again, please silence all your cell phones. Uh, I do have an announcement. Uh, due to the uh, impending weather, the hotel will make an overall announcement. We'll all hear it if we need to shelter in place. And they will instruct us to go downstairs to the first floor, the Georgia rooms. That is the hotel's shelter in place area. If you haven't already, once again, please download the app. As everyone saw yesterday, it's very interactive with the live Q&A. We will have some of that today for this panel as well. Full bios are available on the website, www.sbtw2017.com. And uh, for today's session at 3.30, the DOD SBA Collaboration Best Practices session, please sit at a table designated for your government contracting area, and that is um, noticed on the badge, on your badge. You have a ribbon, a colored ribbon. You'll see those tables designated that way. Okay, for this morning's panel, the Small Business Program Implementation, we have our moderator, Ms. Casey Diaz, who's the Associate Director at the DOD Office of Small Business, Ms. Pamela Cal Calicut, who is the Army Small Business Deputy Director, Mr. Jamie Adams, who is the Air Force Small Business Director, and Ms. Tatia Evelyn Bellamy, who is DCMA Small Business Director. Let's give them a hand. Thank you, Lydia. Good morning, everyone. So this is day two for some and day three for others. We've had a wonderful training so far. I think we've had some really phenomenal uh, speakers. I hope you agree. Can we give our speakers from two days ago? Round of applause, great. So we wanna keep the momentum going. We've got a wonderful panel, as Lydia introduced, and this session is going to identify best practices and things that um, these people have put in place to establish good working, productive relationships with our counterparts, our acquisition team members, our program managers, our contracting officers. So I'm going to turn things over to our panelists, let them kind of share some of their, their knowledge and their expertise and lessons learned and then we're going to have a Q&A and we want some interaction from you and I have some questions for the panel as well and so without further delay I'm gonna turn it over just want to introduce yourself and okay. tell us a little bit more All right. Good morning. about what you do my coffee was delayed <laughs> I'm glad to see everyone I'm glad to be here as the director of DCMA um, of small business DCMA is broken down within two components for small business. We have a small business office that reports to directly to the director that handles mostly the affairs of the agency from a headquarters level. That's basically where our collaboration comes from with our agency procurement center, our collaboration with senior leadership, agency strategic objectives, and any capability models that are, are, are in place for the agency. Small business is a part of those. We also handle any ombudsman concerns. The bulk of DCMA small business is within the Small Business Compliance Center, where we have an uh, East and West uh, group that does compliance reviews, and we also manage the uh, mentor protege program and CSP program for DOD OSBP. So in that, we have a, a uh, very, uh, a basket full of responsibilities, and those responsibilities really benefit not only uh, uh, DCMA, but they benefit the services in helping us uh, accomplish our mission uh, more effectively and efficiently, and also with one primary goal of expanding that small business industrial base 
which basically goes even far beyond uh, the military service. It could actually be our neighbors, our friends who might have jobs uh, and looking for opportunities. So we try to take those uh, experiences seriously and do a good job for the agency. Thank you. Ms. Callicut. Good morning. I'm Pam Calicut. I'm the Deputy Director for the Army's Office of Small Business Programs, and I'm happy to be here today also. In the Army's Office of Small Business Programs, we have uh, program managers who are responsible for the socioeconomic groups. Uh, we also are aligned by command, so all of our program managers are assigned to a command to assist them with any issues that they may have. We work on policy. Uh, PMR reviews. We work with our with DASAP, who's our contract execution office. They're responsible for all the offices that execute contracts. And we also uh, partner with the other services, the Navy, the Air Force, on issues and concerns that we may have. Good morning. I'm Jamie Adams from the Air Force Small Business Office. Um, as far as the office makeup and uh, the things we do, pretty well mirrors what uh, Pam has said for the Army. Uh, we have essentially our office is divided up by portfolio managers instead of program managers. But each portfolio manager is assigned uh, a series of match comms. And then the Air Force uh, also has the PEOs, uh, which manage the major weapon systems and major programs, the ACAT level one, two programs for the Air Force. So we have the program managers, uh, or the portfolio managers assigned to uh, various PEOs, as well as the MAGCOMs. Uh, we, you know, work same as Army, Navy, uh, in developing, you know, our goaling processes and things of that nature for, uh, dissemination to the field. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to start our questions. Our first question is, how can small business professionals build strong relationships with other members of the acquisition team, like program managers and contracting officers? What are your expectations of your small business folks building that relationship? Anyone can answer. Okay, from uh, building relationships with contracting officers, one of the things that we need to call upon, and within the Air Force, about 95% of our small business professionals, of the 150 of small business professionals that we have in the Air Force, uh, about 90 to 95% originally came out of our card-carrying 1102s, as I call them. And, uh, you know, you've been there. So the one thing that you know I would advise any of you is look back and think back on your days when you were in the contracting office and you had to deal with you know the various uh, activities as far as an acquisition is concerned. What impressed you? One of the things I came from the dark side as well, and uh, so uh, my, most of my career. Matter of fact, I've only been in the, con the small business career for about six months now. So bear with me and accept my mistakes. But one of the things that impressed me is. A small business person would get up from behind their desk and get out and work with us. In other words, instead of coming in there, we talk about a seat at the table, and it's one thing to be an advisor and, uh, and a business advisor here. But one thing that I always appreciated was the person that could come in there and sit down and help me write, uh, you know, market research, help me write the acquisition strategy, instead of just coming in there telling me where I did it wrong. Uh, so. So those are the kind of things that you know look at call upon your experiences and look back I don't need to tell anyone how to build a relationship you know you you know mutual trust and understanding of what one another do uh, you know those kind of things go hand in hand they're common sense and you know you have those interpersonal relationships and interpersonal skills but I would think say that be a value-added partner to the contracting officer rather than uh, just coming in there and telling them you know, what they need to do or where they made their mistakes. So I echo what Jamie said, uh, that that's on my notes, is to add value to the acquisition process. Be helpful, uh, be responsive. So if you're getting questions from the contracting officer and they're asking for your assistance, the best way to build a relationship is uh, to be helpful. Be involved in the market research, know your business. 
Because if you're credible and you know your business, they're going to be willing to come to you. But if you're not credible, you're not providing assistance, uh, you're always saying no and not, we can do this, however, we can do this. So you've always got to find a way to get to where they're trying to get to meet the mission. We can't always say it has to be a small business. Um, a small business might not be the answer for that requirement. So we've got to pick our battles and make sure that we're providing good advice to the contracting officers. So I'm going to be the oddball and say oftentimes uh, uh, acquisition offices, uh, contracting officers, and PMs, they have not in the past really uh, respected or giving small business professionals the opportunities to participate. And many offices have uh, overlooked small business professionals, and in that, small business professionals may not have realized how valuable they are. And because it has been practices that sometimes uh, procurements could get out the door without a small business professional's uh, coordination or input. They just might send off a 2579, but may not have included you in a very critical uh, acquisition. So my advice is, first, I like to tell my staff and people, first, you are very valuable. You have a lot to bring to the table, and as an 1102 or within the contracting office, your, your experience uh, contributes uh, to the mission. And really, uh, without you, they can't operate, and without them, we can't operate. So we could really make, I tell people, we could make their lives a whole lot better if you would just come to us first, and we can help you with resources, opportunities, meeting goals. So my advice is first thing as small business professionals, feel the value in yourself that you have something to offer even though you're just in the small business office. That's the first thing. And the second thing, <laughs> you, you, you know, you, uh, you, you get respect, you, you have to take respect sometime. Go over and acquaint yourself with contracting officers and with the procurement centers and office and let them know who you are and what you have to offer. If you don't tell them, they won't know. That's perfect. So that kind of goes into my, our next question. How do you communicate and develop those relationships and obtain buy-in from contracting officers regarding your agency's small business goals? Okay. Well, for DCMA, we have monthly meetings with our procurement center. Um, we did not have that before, but we do have it now since I found out we were responsible I was to make sure we met the goals. <laughs> so, uh, so for our agency, we can't sit by and watch, uh, wait for other people to do things. So what we've instilled is a, a, a great communication where I meet with the director and the deputy director of DCMA Procurement Center. We also include program managers and make sure that our small business staff understand what the agency top five next codes are that we can assist them with. So we've kind of pushed ourselves on them uh, in a way to be more helpful. Uh, we make sure that the standard um, process when they say, oh, I can't find a small business or a small business uh, can't do this, this, this acquisition is too big. And we said, no, it's not. Uh, we t try to tell them about other opportunities, uh, multiple awards, small business set-asides. Uh, we give them a little bit of our database uh, list of contractors that when we go out to these outreach events, we do vetting and we get the information for them. So we, we actually go to them, monthly meetings, uh, and then uh, quickly, it starts with leadership. So you have to go to the leadership and say, hey, you're forgetting small business. So if leadership is aware of small business, it really can trickle down with the offices. So I think one of the um, things that we do need to do uh, is get leadership involved. So part of it would be is having your leadership send a letter out, signed by the leadership, saying how they support small business, how they support what the goals are, 
identifying what the goals are. Some people may not even know what the goals are. So if you don't know what the goals are and you don't know how you can contribute to achieving the goals, then it's very difficult to meet goals that you're unaware of. So that is the first part, it's getting leadership involved, getting leadership to sign letters stating, I, I support these goals, I support small business. So that's, that's one of them. The other thing is educating everybody in the organization on the value that small businesses bring to the table to help achieve the mission. So if they're unaware of the value that small businesses bring, because we all know that someone out there, contracting officers, have experienced a bad contract. And so they're only gonna go back to what their experience is. There are numerous large businesses that don't perform, but you do, you do not continue to hear about the large businesses. But when small businesses do not perform, then you have folks who say they don't want to award to small businesses because they can't perform. I also say that in order for us to be advocates for small business, we have to do market research, we have to know what companies are out there in the different NAICS codes, we have to know about their past performance. What type of work are they already doing with the Army or with the agency? So if, you're, if you come armed with that and you know what small businesses are already doing within the agency, then that's going to add value to you stating that here's what small business can do. This requirement can be set aside for small business. The whole requirement doesn't have to be set aside for small business. Perhaps they can reserve a portion of the requirement for small business. So it's not necessary that you need the whole requirement Based on your market research, what can small business do? Give small business a portion of the work. Okay, this, this is interesting when we talk about helping someone understand goals. When the first thing that you see within the Air Force, at least on our, one of our bumper stickers, is we're beyond goals. Uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, we're, we're, trying to, we're trying to de emphasize the goals in, in one respect right here, but the numbers are just, the numbers are what they are, and, and they're gonna be important, because when we communicate outside of our service, uh, we communicate to Congress, and we communicate to everyone else, they wanna know what we're doing, and the way that they measure us is within the numbers that are assigned as goals and things of that nature. So what one, first thing we wanna do, in the Air Force at least, is we try to help people understand exactly how, you know, we, we do the goal setting process. And the first thing that within the Air Force is, is we take the numbers that are given to us by OSD, and we divide it by three. We don't know why three other than it's a good round number. But then we turn, and then we multiply that times the coefficient of the square root of 10. <laughs> and, and, we get, and we give it to everybody and tell them these are your goals for the next year. <laughs> so, but actually, it, 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 it's, in one respect, it is, we do try to help them understand exactly how you know, the goals and the numbers are so that they, they, they do know that there is some type of you know, mathematical or some type of formula. It's not just, you know, okay, this is what you did last year, so you gotta do it again this year, uh, or better this year, for that matter. So uh, helping, them, helping leadership to understand, getting leadership involved, very, uh, you know, very important in uh, you know, working with, with the customers and, and things. That, so bringing all that to the table and helping them understand. And then the other thing that our uh, PEOs and other leadership want is, okay, don't tell me on 30 September this is what you did this year when there's no opportunity to correct. Mm -hmm. You don't have any, you know, give me some proactive uh, or give me some leading indicators as to, you know, I'm not meeting my goal and what can I do and give me some help in working up, you know, a plan of action so that we can do this. A very significant complaint because, you know, we, we look at these numbers, but then, you know, periodically we might look at them, but we have to establish and we have to, to put the things that are important in front of our leadership and we have to help them with data-driven decisions. That, that's a key with ours. Okay, thank you. So my next question is three parts. Do you have contracting professionals rotate into your small business offices? And if so, what are some of your best practices? What do they learn and what is the benefit when they return to contracting? Well, for DCMA, 
uh, we, we have had contracting professionals rotate into small business, and I actually kept them, so they're here today. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so I think uh, that, that opportunity is there. I think it's good to have experiences on both sides because those uh, contract specialists really provided a lot to small business when it comes to an accurate review uh, an analysis of a 2579, uh, providing uh, expert advice on market research. Um, so they brought a lot to small business, and in turn, small business could bring a lot to the procurement office. So uh, I, the experience is re rewarding, the exchange is very much needed, and I would suggest if a uh, person's not doing that, I think that will be something that will be beneficial to your agency. I see Dr. Hatcher here now. He was with, with procurement for quite a while, and he's the head small business guy at headquarters, so uh, it works. So in the Army's Office of Small Business Programs, we've had four contracting uh, professionals rotate through our, our office. We had two last year, and we currently have two contracting officers that are working in our office now. Um, they get to learn our different programs, the socioeconomic groups, the requirements, uh, the statutory requirements for those socioeconomic groups. We're, we have them working on our small business career field implementation. We have one working on our mentor protege program to improve our mentor protege program and to understand the mentor protege program because not a lot of uh, Contracting officers understand the mentor, mentor protege program. Uh, we we have them working on policies, uh, just different requirements that we have in our office that we need to get out. What value is that for the contracting professional? Number one, they have I believe and I hope that when they leave our office, they have a better uh, a better understanding of the small business professional what we do, what value we bring to the table, and how they can better assist us and the organization to meet our mission, to meet our goals. If they understand us much better, and they understand the requirements, and they understand that we're not always trying to get everything set aside for small business, that there are various ways to achieve our goals, I think that they, they'll be, they will go out and be advocates for us also. So we're advocates, but we need the contracting officers to be advocates for us too. We need them to advocate for us when they're talking to the requiring activity. Uh, they're talking to the requiring activity more so than us, so therefore, if we educate them, then they become advocates for us also. Uh, okay, within the Air Force, about 40% uh, of our uh, small business professionals are uh, the deputies within the installation contracting offices. And they spend, uh, the part-time spend about 25% as far as their PD is concerned. We. We have had, and matter of fact, in this room today is uh, a young lady that uh, spent the last five weeks up in the small business office as part of our career broadening program, and uh, she came from one of the installations here. So she's the deputy, and she can take back the information there within there. We've had two of them. Uh, Mary Peets just left our office last Friday, was her last day in the office, and came by here on her way back out to uh, Arizona, where she's currently stationed. But uh, long term, as far as the career broadening program, we're working, trying to work with our contracting community to establish a three-year uh, rotational plan within the uh, bringing in contracting professionals from the field and rotating them through as part of their three-year rotation within the career broadening program for the Air Force. Uh, but right now, we haven't been too successful in, in cracking that nut with the uh, contracting community because they want to guard their assets real close in that respect. Okay, so follow on. What are some common misperceptions that contracting officers have about small business professionals? And what are misperceptions that our small business professionals have about contracting officers? So I'll say the first misconception is we only do 2579s. <laughs> and we all know that we do more than 2579s. In saying that, though, I've been to several organizations on PMRs, 
And even when I talk to the small business specialist or I talk to the commander of that office, the commander says to me that this individual is not spending an eight hour day with small business, but they have no idea what the small business person does. So I think the small business specialist can help by number one, going in and talk to the commander, letting them know what value you bring to the table. Here's what I do for you. Here's how I can help with requirements. If they're unaware of that, and if they think that all you're doing is sitting back there, signing 2579s, they don't know that you're involved in market research, you need a seat at the table at the beginning of the acquisition process. So you should be aware of all acquisitions that are going on in your agency. And you need to add value when you are there. You need to come to the table so that you can offer suggestions on how to get the requirement done. So we ourselves in the small business community, we have to come to the table, add value, and let them know what we're doing in their offices. And it's not just about 2579s. So I agree with both of them. Uh, they are right with the perception of contracting officers would think uh, that that's all we do. Uh, I just had a very embarrassing moment uh, at DCMA where we have our procurement centers stand down and they asked me to come over and brief uh, the contracting officers and program managers and so I briefed them on DCMA small business and I asked them uh, after all that has been said uh, give me three things that you can take away from my presentation that will help you do your job better. And the one thing that stuck to my mind as a gentleman stood up and said, I didn't even know you all existed. So that told me right there, we didn't know you all did all that. You know, so I said, that showed me that that's more work to be done because we're so geographically located within various regions. And so we provide 90% of what we do is in support of the department in services. But 10% of what we do is to take care of our business at home. We do need computers, telecommunication, house cleaning, tissue, you know, regular stuff to make it by throughout the day. And so the message I realized needed to start, uh, the senior leadership knows, but those people making pertinent decisions do not know. So uh, we will make ourselves available. So that was a misconception, um, but we're working on that. Yeah, I don't wanna say a misperception, but many of the uh, contracting officers, you know, talk about uh, the 2579s is our we're a one-trick pony. That, that's exactly what they want us to sign to 2579, <laughs> and you're out of the equation. Uh, they don't understand and don't know uh, what we do at the follow-on is for after contract award. We have a lot of responsibility after contract award that we need to, uh, you know, make them aware of. Training and education is going to be important in uh, in dealing with our uh, contracting community. But um, I, I totally agree that you know the biggest misperception is the 2579 is. That, that's your only play in the ball game. Thank you. Before I go into this next question, Ms. Taylor, do we have any, any uh, questions from the floor? Okay, the first question is for Ms. Tatia Evelyn Bellamy. What does DCMA procure? Do they award contracts? Yes, DCMA uh, does procure contracts for all of DCMA. We deal with telecommunications, IT, human capital support, and furniture. So those are our top procurements to help us with our operations, CONUS and OCONUS. We're on very, uh, we're also on many um, military installations, Air Force and Army installations, where we take care of all the telecommunications for that, and also maintenance. That is done by a small group of staff, maybe 10, at DCMA headquarters that handles that for all of uh, DCMA. Did I answer that? Okay. <laughs> Next question. How do you feel about someone who does not have a contracting or program manager background to become a small business specialist? Well, 
lot of my friends don't have these degrees, so I don't know. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, for, and they talk about, uh, I think that the small business, uh, you know, we need, we need to look beyond. In other words, you know, don't, don't just look inward all the time, but look beyond and say, you know, that there's a lot to be offered. I mean, uh, Mr. Teske, uh, who was the director, you know, came from the legal field, and he brought a lot to the table. And, uh, and so I think that, you know, small business professionals can come from any career field. One of our big challenges is going to be as we stand up this career field, uh, especially with the way that the federal uh, hiring system comes in there, how do we reach out? Because if I write a PD for an 1102, then that position stays as an 1102 PD, and that's the only people that will be able to apply for that if you have the requisite background associated with that. Um, so how do I get the program management, the 1101s, and a blended career field, if you will? Uh, that, that's a very uh, difficult challenge, but I think that our career field would benefit, uh, you know, tremendously by having requirements individual. Those are the people that can come in there and, and look at it and say, from a contracting perspective, if the requirements people tell me that, you know, they, they need this thing painted purple, I have to accept that as part of their requirements. And my technical or engineering background, uh, which is none, you know, wouldn't allow me to challenge any of that. So I think there's a lot can be said for uh, you know someone outside of the uh, contracting and or program management career field uh, working as small business professional. Thank you. So from the Army's perspective, what I will say is that Mr. Marks, the director of the Army's Office of Small Business Programs, has made a decision that the 1101s is the career field that the Army will use across uh, the Army for the small business specialist. However, that doesn't mean that someone, you can, although the PD when it's posted will be in 1101, there are, uh, as long as you meet the requirements of the PD, you're applying for a job as an 1101. So in my opinion, it doesn't matter if you come from a different career field, I think what we're interested in is people who are professionals, who are able to come in and learn, and to do the job and to add value. That's what we're looking for. So being in a different career field, I think you can bring a different perspective uh, to the small business career field, and uh, we need those people. I think professional diversity is good because someone coming in with a QA background or IT background could definitely benefit the agency acquisition process because they could help them as a small business professional saying, hey, I used to work in this area. Let me help you with resources of some of my background. We have people now within uh, DCMA small business as professionals who do have uh, teaching backgrounds, IT backgrounds, QA backgrounds, and it provides value when they go out on reviews uh, to assist uh, contractors with outreach and resources or trying to assist them in meeting their goals because they would have insight on opportunities that are available. So professional diversity uh, is definitely a must and I think that was one of the core uh, ideas of uh, implementing the small business career field, um, allowing that diversity in there instead of just 1102 to uh, build a cadre of professionals to help us do our jobs. Well said. One more question? One more. Do you encourage rotation of contracting staff through the small business office at the field level? At Army OSBP, it, we, we do not have a limitation on who can come in the office. I think the biggest problem has been those folks who are interested in a developmental assignment, because what I'll say is uh, prior to the four developmentals that we have or that we've had, we've put out an announcement. We got no responses. I have went out on PMRs. I've talked to folks. I've asked if they've seen the announcement. The people have never seen the announcement. So whether you're on the contracting side or you're a small business person, you're interested in the developmental assignments, if they've never seen the announcement, then they can't apply. Uh, we use our DACM office to put the announcement out. 
Sometimes it's the leadership that's unwilling to let someone go on a, de on a developmental assignment. So that's been our biggest uh, issue with getting folks in. Not that we're turning folks down, it's that the leadership doesn't permit people to come on the developmental assignment or people have no idea that the developmental assignment exists. So we've had a 13 in our office uh, before and she actually came from the program management side we had a contracting officer in our office, and we currently have two contracting officers uh, in our office. Yeah, for the Air Force, I think I mentioned earlier about the, the five-week rotational program, and these are individuals came out of the field. Is it, and just looking back on it right now, I know, and, and I don't want to skip anyone, but uh, slide anyone, but there's three individuals in this room right now that, you know, have run through the program, and they came out of the field. And so, you know, we, we encourage and we try to, uh, you know, bring in as many people uh, to help them understand and develop, you know, for the small business career field that we need. Okay. Before I ask my next question, are there any questions from the floor for anyone that's not using our mobile app? There we go. Sorry. Hi, Sean Crean with SBA. Uh, as you roll out the small business uh, training and program, will there be any opportunity to collaborate with SBA so our folks may be able to participate in that as well? Well, I think we're having a good relationship, Sean. <laughs> so uh, good you brought that up because we, we did establish an MOU with SBA to help us do our jobs better. Uh, in that the compliance reviews that we perform on contracts that are administered by DCMA, uh, SBA helps us in that they accept our reviews. We've also improved the performance rating, but most importantly, we're gonna collaborate on training. They have some great ideas and resources, SBA does, that DCMA could piggyback off of. Um, they could help us improve how we do business, and I think we have a lot to offer SBA. So building those relationships, and uh, it, it's not so much even the small business professionals. I think us leaders and directors, uh, we come from behind the desk, and we start collaborating and getting out there. Sean came down to Chester, Virginia and uh, had a great day with us. He did not have to do that, you know, at his level, but he came down, drove, and we spent all day And how we could best support the services, the Department of Defense, uh, you know, reduce costs and also improve performance. So, thanks. I'm just gonna say, that, that's a great idea, Sean, I, I you know. <laughs> Didn't think about it before now, but I took it down as an action item to go back and uh, definitely work with you on that. Hi, Sean, I agree with uh, both of them uh, that we could uh, learn from SBA, and of course SBA could learn some things about the Army. And um, I wrote that as a note too, to see how we can use our developmental program to perhaps bring someone in from the SBA into our office. We have a question on the floor. Yes, good morning. My, uh, my name is Faye Zayas. I'm from the Space and Naval Warfare Systems Command. I have a question and a suggestion. Um, the question, uh, well, it's actually the suggestion is, is that there's been a lot of comments here about rotational opportunities for our internal stakeholders to rotate to the small business office. Um, my suggestion is, is that we, in our office, we have some of our small business professionals rotate to, let's say, for instance, the contracting office uh, for 90 days to get a feel because they're a key stakeholder. Is that, um, is anybody here considering doing that as opposed to just having the uh, external stake, excuse me, the, like the contracts folks or technical folks rotate uh, into the small business office? And we actually have an empty cubicle with an NMCI machine where we also invite other small business professionals or internal stakeholders to come over and spend time in our office. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Well, I have a question. What is a small business concept or issue that you notice is being misinterpreted or misapplied? 
How can small business professionals ensure that we get it right when we assist the community? Examples, rule of two, limitations on subcontracting, bundling. So I think the, the, big, the biggest issue right now, I think, for the small business professional is the difference between subcontracting and small business participation. Mm -hmm. There have been uh, numerous issues with how we put that in a solicitation, how we, uh, do you evaluate, what do you evaluate, what is a pass-go, what needs adjectival ratings, uh, small, uh, subcontracting is goals, small business participation is not goals. I've seen some documents where we do call small business participation goals, and it's not, uh, so when a solicitation goes out, I hope that the small business specialists out there are the ones that are providing guidance and advice to the contracting officers. However, when the solicitations get out there and there is confusion regarding subcontracting and participation, then our credibility comes into play. So if we, the small business community, don't really understand the difference between subcontracting and participation, then we've got to seek advice from those SMEs that know the difference, know how to put it out. If you know of a agency that has put out a solicitation with subcontracting and small business participation in it, uh, go to them. Ask them for a sample of what they uh, wrote up uh, so that we, number one, can be consistent across the board on how we're putting out solicitations that uh, include subcontracting and small business participation. And by all means, make sure that we have the right uh, adjectival ratings to permit us to evaluate a participation plan. If all you have is acceptable and unacceptable, if it's somewhere in between, how do you evaluate that? I, I will second the fact that the participation plan and the <coughs> subcontracting plan, uh, that, that tug of war, if you will, between the two of those entities is probably the number one mis misconceived idea at this point in time. I'd also like to offer up that uh, bundling and consolidations uh, and, and looking at you know some of the DNFs that come through for this uh, because the competing interests between category management and strategic sourcing, those invite and encourage a bundled requirement, if you will, or and I don't want to use that bad word, four letter word bundled, but the bundle requirement or even the consolidation, if uh, looking at it from the standpoint, how do you, how do you put, put forth a creditable DNF you know, for this, you know, uh, in supporting of this, and then, you know, us small business professionals looking at it and saying, wait a minute, this doesn't fully support. Why can't we break out? I mean, the FAR still is not changed, so it looks for us to break out, but the minute that we try to push breakouts uh, for small business, you know, we're being more of an obstructionist than uh, a help to the acquisition process. So I think, you know, that from the misconception there is that, you know, how do you, how do you balance those and how do you work that? I, I'd like to add one more thing in there. How many small business specialists have heard or know what mini, minimum quantitative requirements is? That's interesting. So that goes to the difference between subcontracting and small business participation. So if your hand wasn't up when I ask what minimum quantitative requirements is, that's your homework. Go research that, find out what mini minimum quantitative requirements are, and then I think that will go a long way with us understanding the difference between subcontracting and small business participation. What I was gonna say is from a, a contract administration, because DCMA primarily deals with contract administration, so when they get the homework question, we could talk about it because it does impact how we do and perform reviews. You have to know what you're looking at when you're doing uh, small business contract administration. You have to ensure uh, that 
uh, you're not misinterpreting a utilization plan or participation plan for the subcontracting plan. And it's also good in the uh, early uh, acquisition process, the pre-award phase, uh, when you know the difference between those two, you'll be able to provide that value uh, in assisting in the development of a subcontracting plan. Thank you. So I don't want to be selfish. Any questions on the floor? Okay. Kim? Ooh, 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 me. Great. <laughs> Good morning. How are you guys doing? Uh, great panel. I want to go back and address category management and strategic sourcing. Obviously, you know that is DOD's initiative. We're leaning toward more supply chain logistics and uh, uh, better managing of doing our business. So to say you get a requirement and you wanna break that out, that's against what the DOD is leaning toward. So how do we deal with that? Because obviously the way we do business, we've, we've got to do a better job. That's an excellent question, and, and I think it's one that we struggle with all the time. I mean, when you say, how do you deal with it? Uh, because, I mean, it's being pushed from OMB. Uh, and, when, and a few months ago, when I, uh, before I came to uh, the small business office, I was in SAF AQCA, which, uh, again, was the acquisition and strategic sourcing, category management, and those programs came underneath me, and, uh, and I was their proponent at that point in time. And now I'm their opposition. So, you know, it, it's, it's, it's very difficult because uh, I didn't necessarily agree. I, I think, you know, what we have to do is look at it and, and strike the balance uh, because not everything, you know, basically needs to follow the principles of category management. Services, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I look at that a little bit differently than, you know, commodities, an item that's manufactured and we're going to buy in large quantities, and, you know, there's only a few select sources. Uh, those things are, are category management uh, centric. That, that's, that's the ones we should go with. Things that have a broader base out here, because when you, when you write an IDIQ contract, you're locking out competition is for, except for the awarded contractors for the duration of that contract suite, whether it's three years, five years, or whatever. And so that has a tendency to affect you know, the industrial base because businesses make decisions that we're not going to um, you know, work in that area right here, or if they can't get you know, part of the DOD market, if you will. And so those things, you know, they, they make, make hard decisions. And you look at the declining number of new entrants in here. One of the figures that we, we proposed when we briefed small business up to the SECAF's office and, uh, and thereabouts is, and especially with the new administration and jobs, 61% of the job market, the new jobs that are created are created by small business. That, that's very significant in the market for each year. And those are the things that you know the, the administration wanna hear. But when the small businesses are declining because we lock them out for three to five years in some of these areas, uh, now, how do you break that nut and crack? I don't know, because it's very hard and difficult to argue with the effectiveness and the efficiencies associated with you know, the, uh, the, the concept of strategic management and uh, our category management strategic sourcing. So it, I think we need to work together, put it on our strategic you know, initiative list and you know, come up and get some of our bright minds and bright people out there. But I really don't have a good answer for your question. I know I've rambled a little bit, but. Mike's coming. <laughs> yeah, so at the end of the day, it's really all about readiness. The warfighter don't care how you get, get that bullet, whether you get it through category management, you get it through strategic sourcing, or an IDIQ contract. He just knows when he gets ready to go fight that battle. He needs that bullet. And so that's what my commander is pushing. It really is all about readiness. And the best way, the, the most efficient way that we can get that product to that soldier is what it's all about. So we're gonna have to figure out, I think from a small business perspective, how we really operationalize small business. And, and, and that's a very good point. Cause let me just say that, you know, in war there is no second place. So readiness has to be at the forefront. That's our mission, you know, throughout right here. We just have to strike that balance and make sure that we work it. 
So I think another way of looking at this too is our responsibility to educate the small business community about what's going on. One of the biggest things that I've seen with the small business community in many talks with small businesses, they don't understand they're gonna have to change their business models to meet the marketplace. The marketplace is not gonna change so that they can maintain the status quo in their businesses. So us understanding what's coming down the pike, whether it's strategic sourcing, whether it's um, category management, whatever we're calling it, this, if that's the way the market's going, then we've got to start educating the small businesses we deal with on how they can break into that market. Now, some things will be coming along that will help, like the new limitation of subcontracting, where they can team on larger contracts. And so we as small business professionals have to start looking at the market research we're doing, not just in terms of assessing how an individual business can do things, but can we reasonably set aside larger contracts because we have teams of small businesses that come in in responses to our market research. And we look at fostering that kind of education out there today so that when this stuff kicks into full force, it mitigates some of that risk to small businesses out there. But the facts of the, is, is that the market's not going to change to accommodate the small business. I don't care how much we pound the, the drum about the importance of it or whatever. There are certain realities out there, whether they're budgetary or lack of personnel or whatever, that are driving us towards more efficiencies, which means more consolidation and stuff. So we as a community have got to figure out how we can help that small business community change to meet the demands of the new market. Uh, thank you. Yeah, uh, I just want to clarify, Tommy Marks, I want to clarify one thing Nancy said. So it's not a DOD initiative, so that everybody in this room understands. Strategic sourcing and category management is a federally driven uh, process by an executive order signed by President Obama. So I sat on the initial boards when I was the services director for the Army. Uh, it's here to stay. So what we have to do in our community is understand what that process is about and then to be able to provide the right uh, assessments on whether or not strategic sourcing as a tool is the way to go to meet that readiness objective or category management or it's done the traditional way. So uh, understanding major studies have been done. So it just made our job a little harder, right? And we got to think a little smarter. But uh, that's what it's about. Thank you. Any more on the floor? One more? OK. Uh, good morning. I'm Marcia Cruz, and I'm with the Naval Supply Command out at Fleet Logistics Center San Diego. And our office is responsible for supporting NAVSUP as the executive agent for strategic sourcing. And what we do, aside from our spend analysis, is we actually work with small business. We've recently awarded a services contract. I mean, it's a MAC IDIQ where we have, it's 100% set aside for small businesses. We actually have it at a $750 million program in order to stay consistent and offer those opportunities for more small businesses, we also have an on-ramping and off-ramping provision. So we've just awarded it, and I put a number of pamphlets out there, and we are working with the small business community in seeing if they have an opportunity, then we will look at their proposal and possibly on-ramp them. But we've limited across the United States to four areas. So we have a Hawaii, Guam region, and then we have the Northwest and Southwest region, and then the Northeast region and Southeast region. And so, you know, if, if any of you are interested, please take a look at that brochure because, again, we will work with the small businesses, we will work with the contracting offices to set aside, even within those areas, some of the socioeconomic groups. We've awarded to, I believe it's about 73 small businesses that are supposed to support these services contracts. Thank you. Okay. We got about four minutes left, and so I'm going to close with one more question for our panelists. 
And that's going to be, what is the number one takeaway or best practice you want to provide to a small business professional that you wish the advice could have been given to you? Well, <laughs> I want to say this morning, uh, the number one takeaway to everyone is to understand your value. Small business is not a retirement home. And people would say, <laughs> That's right. oh, you in small business, you getting ready to retire, and I want to say, hell no, I'm going to be around for a while. So it is a very valuable career field. We need to let people know we have a lot to offer. We need to let people know our knowledge, not just at the water counter or the coffee place, but talk to directors, contracting officers, people in our office, and hold our head up. That's the first thing I want to say. And so you, you, Get what you deserve and what is ours. You let folks know, I have a lot to offer to the acquisition process. I am a part of expanding the industrial base. And then while you're doing all that talking, we need to re-educate ourselves and get all the knowledge that we can because many of us have been around for a while and we cannot stick an 8-track in an MP3 player. <laughs> to learn the new rules, get involved with legislation, take advantage of these conferences and opportunities. We need to start networking, take advantage of exchanges, and know the value. And the best thing of that, when you get off of work every day, you're going to feel real good about yourself and stop complaining. That's all. You didn't have anything to share, did you? <laughs> I, I would agree with all of that. I would also say you have to be engaged. Again, you have to add value. You have to be credible. When you're providing information to the contracting officers, to the requirements activities, you have to be credible. You have to be willing to assist with market research, to come with information. If you believe that there's a requirement that can be set aside for a small business or that can be a reserve for a small business, you need to come with appropriate market research to prove your point as to this is something that small businesses can do, and uh, they have done, they are performing. You also need to communicate with your peers. In the Army, we, we don't have to just talk to Army personnel. We can talk to the Navy, we can talk to the Air Force. So I think you need to broaden your network and talk outside of the Army, talk outside of your community, find out what they're doing, see how they're making it work for them. And I, I think that'll go a long way. Yeah, I, I don't know that I can add anything to that or add it any better than, uh, you know, been said here. I think uh, you know, small business is, uh, it, it's, it's really an important job. It, it's a significant job within, uh, within DOD, within the Air Force, within the federal government in total. Uh, you know, it's about the industrial base. It's not just about making a number or it's not just about awarding a contract to small business, but it's about developing the industrial base here, uh, significant for our country. Okay, well, we are on time. I want y'all to know that. We're going to keep this momentum going. Can we give our panelists a round of applause? I think they did a great job. Good information. They'll be around. Please talk to them. We have other leadership here. And I'm going to turn it back over to Ms. Taylor. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.